Welcome to our community workshop through the Center for Learning Disabilities. Um, I'm Dr. Hart, and I'm going to be introducing our speaker tonight. We also have Dr. Simmons here and um, Dr. Shin and Dr. Rogers, and one of our um, our, our founder and, and fearless leader, uh, Ms. Puff Nigos. So we're really excited to have everybody here. And I see Bobby Morgan is here. She's one of our um, acad academic language therapists that works in the um, through the Center for Learning Disabilities in, out of our Amarillo Center office. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker is Karen Mayer Cunningham. And you can see her because she looks snazzy and she has a background, which she told us is a real background. So she's just one of those put together kind of people. <laughs> um, so I, I'm very excited to introduce Karen. Uh, Karen's the founder and CEO of uh, Special Education Academy, which is renowned as the, and she's known as the special education boss, an advocate, a professional speaker, a coach, and a global life changer. She has over 25 years of unwavering dedication to children's advocacy. Um, Karen ensures that students have the services and the resources they need to thrive. Uh, her journey as an advocate began when she was seeking support for her son, which sparked a calling to share knowledge and resources. As you'll see in her presentation, she's very passionate about empowering families and educators. And Karen educates and equips her families to navigate the complexities of the special education system. As a special education boss and advocate, she strives for successful student outcomes, provides top-notch training, education and empowerment for her clients um, and her families through the IEP and 504 process. So Karen's expertise and commitment uh, makes her a very trusted resource and a highly sought after keynote speaker, trainer and advocate. So we are very, very glad to have Karen here tonight. So uh, welcome, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So welcome, everybody. I think that um, one of the leaders here and the host has put the slides um, in the chat so you can access them either now or at the end. And certainly they're yours to have. Um, if, uh, if, if I haven't met you before, my name is Karen Mayer Cunningham, Special Education Boss. I train everyone that sits at the 504 IEP table to navigate and, and negotiate successful student outcomes. And we're doing both of those things, right? We're navigating and we're negotiating. And so on to the next slide, you'll see that I really just have one goal. And my one goal is, is successful student outcomes. And while that may seem simplistic, it's often a little bit of a mountain to climb when you're dealing with humans. And we are dealing with humans in the 504 IEP process. And I want to give you some really great key points tonight that's going to help you um, wherever you are in the process, in the beginning, in the middle, um, <clears throat> or at the end. And, and at the end of this, we'll certainly open it for whatever questions you may have around this presentation or anything related to the 504 IEP advocate process. So next slide. So this is really, really, really important. When did you know something was different? And we're going to park here for just a little bit. I think one of the things that we do is moms and dads and, and guardians and surrogate parents and grandparents is we often wait, right? And wait is a terrible in intervention. Um, it might be good when you're trying to be patient with your spouse or in other things in life. But when we're looking at kiddos and with their differences, I really want you to think back, when did you know something was different? You know, as moms, I know, and as parents, we kind of are a little bit competitive, but then when something's different or something's off, or a child is not meeting expectations and it's our girlfriend or our brother or our uncle, we might go, oh, that's okay, he'll catch up. Your uncle Joe was, didn't, you know, wasn't at that level. And I think that we have to do better at leaning in. And so I always say that an educational intervention is equal, if not more important than a medical intervention. Because the things that we do when we address that something is different is going to set these young people up for the next 80 years after they graduate high school. Put the next slide. How do we respond to the need? How do we respond to the need? So what is the need, right? So the need is an education, anything that's education. I think we get confused with academics, academics, academics. And we are so impressed with academics, aren't we? We're impressed with the valedictorian. 
we're impressed with, you know, super fans, we're impressed with celebrities, we're impressed with athletes, we're impressed with really smart people and great achievers, but we have to respond to the need that's anything that would be educational. What would be educational? That would be um, eating, walking, hearing, seeing, academics, communicative, social, emotional, communication, anything that would show up in an educational day, we can respond to that need. So it's so important that we look at, when we are looking at our children, what might not be in the normed and average range. So let's go to the next slide, because we're gonna respond. Um, because to not respond is, is not a good idea. Waiting is not a good idea. Um, so this is not about, is my kiddo gonna get taller? Um, this is about addressing the need. So what I recommend to all families, if you believe that there's a difference that may in fact be in a disability, we don't know, but if you believe that your child has a difference, go ahead and get your child tested to identify a disability. And so that is something that we look at by a federal law called Child Find. Um, and it's a simple law in the federal government. It started December 2nd, 1975. Um, and it simply says this, that the local education agency has to ILE, they have to identify, locate, and evaluate children with suspected disabilities who may be in need of special education and related services. Now, I don't know where you live, but have you seen people in your neighborhood knocking on doors going, hey, Michelle, anybody struggling with reading? Stephanie, anybody having trouble regulating in your neighborhood? I don't see that. And so um, probably, not in all cases, but probably where you live, you're going to have to be the one that drives this testing. And so let's look at how we get testing on the next slide. So the testing is the testing is called an FIE. And wonderful Dr. Michael Webb, who teaches at Sam Houston State, has he told me in Tomball ISD, he said the F stands for full and full individualized evaluation. And I probably do 500 IEP meetings a year uh, besides um, due process hearings, state complaints, federal complaints. And one of the most egregious things that I see when I receive an opening packet from a family is a pitiful individualized evaluation. And all we have done is waste time. Well, I mean, Karen, what is the point of really a full individual evaluation? If, if you know, if Natalie thinks that her child has a reading disability and her husband had a reading disability, why don't we just test for reading? Because testing does one of two things. If you're taking notes, write this down. Testing does one of two things. It identifies and it eliminates. And I want both. You would never go into a hospital and go, oh, listen, you can test him for high cholesterol, but don't test him for high blood pressure. You wouldn't. You would go to the medical professionals and say, do whatever full panel you need to do so we can determine next steps. All of this is to determine next steps. Okay. And so I want whatever you think your child may have or may not have, I want you to ask the school for a full individualized evaluation. I'm going to stay here for a little bit. I'm going to tell you what that is. Um, and then we have more detailed trainings um, at Special Education Academy on YouTube and all of our platforms if you want more details about each of these sections. But let's park here for a little bit about what is a full and individualized evaluation. So there's eight areas that you want evaluated. The law doesn't say I have to prove my child has a disability. It simply says there's a suspected disability. Okay. So the testing that I'm going to ask for, number one, is a speech and language evaluation to include pragmatic. Well, Karen, my child talks, talks nonstop. That doesn't mean they might not have a deficit in speech and language. There's nine areas that could be addressed in an educational setting. So number one, I'm going to ask for a speech and language evaluation to include pragmatics. Number two, I'm going to ask for an evaluation in sociological. We've learned so much over these many years with the pandemic about what an impact kids have outside of the school setting, right? Sociological, what, what could impact that? Maybe parents are no longer together. Maybe mom was deployed. Maybe they've lost, the students lost a pet. Maybe now um, grandma lives with them. Maybe now they think dad doesn't go to work because he works out of the house. Everything is flipped, right? And to not look at those sociological pieces uh, to see if there's an educational impact, you're gonna be missing something. Number three in the full individualized evaluation, I'm gonna ask for medical, physical. Anything going on with this child physically or medically? Does he take medicine? Is he dispense medicine at school? Is he to dispense medicine at home? Does he have a physical or medical need that he's seeing 
a professional, a therapist, or a, a doctor for. Number four, a full cognitive evaluation. Please listen to me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Ask for a full cognitive evaluation in all seven Gs. Um, what do the Gs stand for? They are brain skills. And I'm going to tell you what they are. Number one is crystallized intelligence. Number two is fluid reasoning. Um, number three is processing speed. Number four is visual processing. Number um, five is auditory processing. Number six is short-term memory. And number seven is long-term memory. And that would be a whole training in itself. But you want all seven. Why? Because if I don't test for some of them, I'm missing them. Your brain skills are so paramount to know. Why? Your brain skills are how you're cooked. It's just how you're made up. It's how you got on this earth, right? And so to not know how you take in information, process it, manipulate it, store it, retrieve it, um, you're going to be missing pieces about how that student um, is going to show up cognitively in your classroom. Number five, adaptive behavior. Uh, those pieces that make me look like my peers, social, um, language, communication, leisure. Um, number seven, achievement. I'm going to ask for formal achievement testing. They're going to always do the three, English, I mean, reading, writing, and math. I'm going to ask for two more. I'm going to ask for OE and LC, oral expression and listening comprehension. There are nine specific learning disabilities. I won't get into them now. If you don't fully test in all seven Gs and fully test in those five achievement areas, you might be missing an area of deficit. Number seven, a full psychological evaluation, or depending on where you are in the United States, it's called an emotional behavior evaluation. I think tragically, this is one of the ones that's just skipped. As we say stuff to mom, like, hey, has Karen been to the office? <laughs> um, is she a behavior problem? And we shouldn't do that, right? When we've been given words um, to be leaders and persuaders, we shouldn't be manipulators with our words. So we all have behaviors. We all process and move this is world right if you told me I had to talk without moving my hands it would be a short presentation that's a behavior that I have so we're looking for any behavioral psychological need and if we don't test for that we don't know um, and then number eight related um, or instructional services what are those those are additional services outside of special education that may be needed or beneficial for a student with a disability they could be braille it could be O and M. It could be occupational therapy and written expression. They could be occupational therapy and sensory. They could be assistive technology and written expression, assistive technology and communication, music therapy, adaptive physical education, and a list of others. And so you want to make sure that you're asking for all eight areas and that we want formal. We're not interested in your informal. We're not interested in your screener. Screens go on windows and doors. They don't go on children. So we want the formal evaluation um, because every time we do a screener or informal, then we have to wait to see if there's a real formal. What children don't have to waste is time. So make sure that when you ask for this full individualized evaluation, that you ask for formal in all areas. So let's look at the next um, slide. The point of this evaluation is to identify the impact of your child's disability to identify the impact of the child's disability, the acuity of it, the need, where am I going to intervene? And so when this testing is returned, and depending on where you live in the United States, once a parent has come in and signed a notice and consent, the district's gonna have 30, 45, or 60 school days to complete the evaluation, school days. So in Texas, it's 45 school days. Let's think about that. That's 25% of the whole year. So I love parents, I love moms and dads and guardians and grandparents, but I hear the most terrible phrase, well, let's just give him a little bit. We're going to keep an eye on him. Let's see how this semester goes. It's a terrible response. If you know there's a need, we need to test now to see if there's something additional we can do. When the testing comes back within 30 days of the testing being completed, then within 30 calendar days, wherever you are in the United States, you must have an IEP meeting or as we say in Texas, an ARD meeting, an admission review and dismissal meeting. So next, we're going to look at what the possible outcomes are after that evaluation is returned. Number one, the next slide, outcome one, your child does not have a disability that needs additional support at school. I didn't say your child didn't have a disability. I didn't say your child didn't have a unique circumstance. I didn't say that the doctor hasn't identified something. 
but that disability, if in fact there is one, does not need additional support at school. It simply means that you may have a disability, but it can be addressed and served solely through general education. Next slide, outcome number two. Your child does have a disability that needs additional support at school, which we would call a 504. And I'll just touch on this briefly because the bulk of this training is about an IEP, but a 504 is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, while it's used greatly in schools, I am not and will never be a fan of this as um, something that we lead with with kids with disabilities. Why? Because it's not an education act. It's a civil rights act. And it simply means whether you're in school or you're an adult working somewhere, you have an identified disability. That entity or that institution, for purposes of today, a public school, could not discriminate against your child when they need accommodations. And so I think that in 28 years of doing this, um, I can count on one hand without using all of my fingers, the children that I serve that actually solely needed a 504. And that is a plan that simply identifies your disability and lays out accommodations. They are civil rights. Um, a couple of things that you should know about a 504, there's no requirement for the school to invite you to the meeting. They can invite your child to the meeting and the adults at the school, whether your child's 17 or seven. And so some of those pieces I'm not a fan of. However, I've had a few, very few kids over the years that either had a very specific medical need or were unbelievably high cognitive, but they had dyslexia. And so to get them dyslexia services, they had to have a 504 plan. Um, but that is what can be provided on a 504. You can have a, a behavior plan, but it's mostly accommodations. And so <clears throat> that is going to be outcome number two, okay? And then outcome number three is your child does have a disability that needs additional support at school called an IEP. The IEP stands for Individualized Individual Education Program, Individual Education Program. And so those are the three possible outcomes. I think somebody had a question in the chat if somebody wants to read it to me um, that I think would be a good uh, place right now before we go into <laughs> developing the IEP. Excellent. So yes, um, Puff did ask, what if the parent and the school do not agree on the outcome of the testing? So what recourse does the parent have if there's no agreement? Yeah, well, I've never been in a meeting where people didn't agree on everything. But in case you're in a meeting, I'm just teasing. If you're in that meeting, the parents have a procedural right for an IEE individualized education evaluation, they simply reach out to the school district and say, I disagree with this evaluation for my child, Billy Smith. I disagree with the OT part of it. I disagree with the cognitive part. I disagree with either the totality of it or the, or the portions of it. Almost always, um, the school will then grant the IE. That simply means that at district expense, they will provide a list of vendors, which are evaluators, uh, they can come in and do like testing in those same areas to see if there's a different outcome. Um, based on that IEE, um, the evaluator of the IEE or the school will have a meeting to look at the IEE and go over it um, and then talk about next steps. Okay. Uh, did somebody have one more question for right now? I can answer it. Yes. Um... The question was, you said the school has 45 to 60 school days to complete the evaluation after requesting the FIE? So an initial FIE, um, what's called an FIIE, a full initial individualized evaluation, has a requirement in the United States to be done in 30 days, 45 days, or 60 days, depending on where you live in the United States. In Texas, it's 45, so those are all school days. So let's say that your evaluation is due April 10th. And by May 10th, you will have had to have had a meeting to talk about those results and see if your child is eligible for special education, um, a 504, or DNQ uh, does not qualify. But those second 30 days are calendar days. Okay? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, so next slide, developing a complete individualized education program on the next slide. I think what's important to know is about this slide is the word complete. Um, this is not a cocktail napkin. Um, this should be longer than your Panera bread order. Um, I see a lot of IPs. I'm like, what is, I have no idea what the point is, or I have no idea what it meant. So uh, for instance, I just got an evaluation back for a little girl. She is five. 
Um, and it's a little lighter than I wanted, but it's 25 pages long. I, I would argue, I like to argue, uh, that if you get an evaluation that's less than 20 pages long, I would be greatly concerned that you didn't get a complete individualized education um, evaluation to write an IEP. So make sure that when you're going over the FIE that you request all eight areas. So now we're gonna sit together as a team based on that evaluation and other sources of data and put together an IEP. So let's look at the next slide. So we're gonna go over five pillars. I think these are paramount for you to know as you're serving your child, as you're uh, the 504 coordinator and the kids coming into special ed, if you're the IEP lead, however you sit at the table, these five components must be uh, populated correctly. So let's talk about pillar number one, present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, PLAF. Um, in some places in the country, it's called the PLOP, a PLAP, but basically it is how Billy shows up at school from bell to bell. If your document in the present levels doesn't talk about when he gets off the bus or out of grandma's car until he leaves, you are not finished. Your present level should be pristine, prescriptive, and puffy. Pristine, prescriptive, and puffy. I think we all know what puffy means. It's your hair due in Texas, right? They should be full and complete. Just like if teachers were leaving, if a teacher was going to be gone for three weeks, they would leave what? Notes for the substitute. They wouldn't go, good luck. Maybe they would, right? They would live really detailed notes of how to serve their classroom, right? And so when I pick up an IEP, um, I should be able to do it. Natalie should be able to do it. Michelle should do it. Stephanie should do it. We should all do it the same because it's that clean of information. It's it's a, a, a map, um, directions. It's a way to serve a student to address their disability and teach them strategies to self-manage it. We have one goal in special education, just one one, to teach a child strategies to self-manage their disability. That's it. If you're not doing that, you haven't written an IEP. So I'm not asking for her math calculations to go away. I'm not asking for her autism to go away. I'm not asking for her visual impairment to go away. But I'm teaching her strategies to self-manage her disability for a lifetime. Okay? So what goes in the present levels? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. So the first thing that I do when I sit down at a meeting is I'll go, hey, Michelle, is it okay? Can I just, just real quick, can I go through Billy's day? And of course, Michelle is lovely, so she'll say yes. And I'll get out a piece of paper, pad of paper, and I will say, okay, how does Billy get to school? And I think sometimes we think this is uh, fundamental. I think you'd be shocked how people don't know. Like the parents, or sometimes the school-based members, right? How does he get to school? Does he ride the bus? Does he ride general ed bus? Does he ride special ed bus? This grandma will drop him off. Is he in a good mood when he gets here? Does he eat breakfast? How does he do at breakfast? What Okay, what happens at 8.05? Okay, that's the first class. What do we do at 8.05? And then I walk through that and I'm writing it all down. And so I'll say at 8.05, who's his teacher? Miss Stephanie, we love her. Okay, how many kids in Miss Stephanie's class? I need to know all of this. We just assume, I don't know, when you went to school, I went to school in a covered wagon um, and there was no air conditioning. And um. I don't know. We just, we were told you go to school, you better hope they never call. That's how my parents raised us, right? I need to know how many kids Stephanie has in her class. Okay, so Miss Stephanie is his fourth grade math teacher. How many kids are in the class? 27. I think it's important when you're teaching, training, or learning that you say things that people can see and feel. If they can't see and feel them, you're just talking, right? So Miss Stephanie has 28 kids. And then I think Billy has support in there, right? He's a paraprofessional. So this is what I would say. I would not say, does he have support? I would say, in Stephanie's class, who is the second adult? Who is the second adult? And this is a whole nother training, but we need to know who that second adult is. Are they a paraprofessional? Are they a level two aid? Are they a teacher? Are they a certified teacher? Are they a sub? Are they a long-term sub? Are they the co-teacher? Is it Mr. Bob that's coming in to help? I mean, I need to know who that second person is. Why? Because we're laying out an individualized education program to teach her to mitigate her disability. I need to know who's serving that student, okay? So Stephanie has Mr. Bob in there. He is a co-teacher. That means he's supporting children with disabilities at that first block of content. And I would say, Stephanie, how many kiddos is Mr. Bob supporting? And there, you're completely allowed to know that. I'm not asking for your name. I'm not asking for disability. And she'll tell you there's two, or she might tell you there's 11. 
I think parents often think when they hear this, oh, my sweet little cherub has this day laid out for him and it will he'll be carried around on a bassinet. That is not accurate. When we are, have kiddos that receive special education or related services, there's usually multiple teachers that are serving multiple students at one time. And then I'll go into the next content. Okay, how long is the good morning time? Stephanie is telling us what the temperature is going to be, how hard the wind's going to blow in the panhandle, right? How many tumbleweeds will be coming across the, the recess field, okay? And then what happens after that? But I'm also going to say, Stephanie, how's he doing in your class? I'm going to stop right there and say, Stephanie, how is he doing in your class? Because most of you lovely people receive a piece of paper and you just nod. Michelle goes over it and you just nod and then it's over and you leave going, what happened, right? And we have a, a responsibility. Actually, the parent is considered the first and most important part of the educational team called the ARD committee or the IEP team. We're actually called in case law, the expert. So you have to be fully participating, which means you have to ask questions. And it's not questioning the team, it's asking questions so you can make an informed decision. Okay, so I'm gonna go through content area. Okay, so after Stephanie, that's at 8.05. What time is that over, Stephanie? 8.53. I don't know why we have to be on the threes, but okay. And then I'm doing my math, right? So where did he go at 8.53? He goes to science. Who is that? Okay, that's Mr. Joseph and Miss Collins. Perfect. Um, he doesn't like science at home. Does he like science there? He loves it. Okay, tell me about that. Who is the second teacher? How is he helping Billy? So I'm walking through his schedule talking about the present levels. Because when you get present levels in an IP meeting or an ARD meeting, somebody other than you has filled them out. They may have given you a copy. They may have not given you a copy. They may be projecting them. They may be lovely. They may not be very good at working with a group of people. Nobody went to school to be in a meeting with me, right? <laughs> and so sometimes people in group meetings, it's called IEP meetings, struggle to be successful in group meetings. It doesn't mean they're not a good teacher. It doesn't mean they're not a good provider. But this is kind of, you know, an arduous uh, legally procedural process. But it's a process about your child. So when you have a question, a concern uh, for the committee, then raise that concern, okay? So we're gonna go through the whole day. Tell me how he's doing in transition. How's he doing at recess? Does he play with other kids? Because at home, he doesn't play with other kids. Does he parallel play? Is he bossing people around? Is he giving kids a, a ticket on the playground? Because he does that at our playground. Just talk about what's going on with your kiddo. This is not clinical. This is your child. And the reason the parents are called the expert is because nobody knows more about the kiddo than the expert. If it's happening at school, it's probably happening at home. It's not a chasm, right? So we're going to talk about all of those areas. We're also going to make sure that we've addressed every person who provides the student an educational product. What is an educational product? It's a product they receive while they're getting an education, right? So I might have this input from Miss Sandy, who is a cafeteria lady. I might have input from Dr. Smith, who is the assistant principal for the junior high, and he sees him every day at lunch. Whoever is working with that student that has input, I want that in the present levels. Do I have academics? Yes, that's what the AA part. But the federal law, the U.S. Supreme Court justices said the FP is everything else, right? How's he doing emotionally? How's he doing cognitively? How is his reading? How is his math? How is his writing? How are his functional needs? We need to know all of that. How does he do when you tell him it's over? We're done doing math. Your favorite thing. Is he going, ah or is he having a fit? Talk about his needs as they show up. It's not good news or bad news. Data doesn't have doesn't have a meter on it. it it just is information and without that data i can't make informed decisions i think a lot of times teachers who i love probably 20 percent of my clients are teachers um want to sometimes you know accessorize the information i just love him <gasps> he is so cute yeah he karate chopped four people this week i know but when he did that he was adorable Right. And I think sometimes teachers who mean well, especially elementary school teachers, we just we're just pulling for Billy. And I want you to pull for Billy. But if you don't tell us the truth, we can't decide on the right intervention. Okay. So present levels of it of academic achievement, bell to bell, what happens throughout the entire day in between things in the room, transition, recess, electives, all the things. Okay. Next slide. Pillar number two. 
<clears throat> Pillar number two is a little harder for people. Annual goals. This sounds so serious. Annual goals. What are annual goals? So the federal government says an annual goal is an identified need. The student, we've identified the need. Um, where do we identify it? In the present levels. What's going to go in the present levels? We're going to put the FIE in there, right? We're also going to put in Michelle's pediatricians. We're going to put in this outside therapist. We're going to put in uh, Miss Rogers, who did the vacation Bible school all summer, and he never needed support. We're going to put in any information that's important. And based on that information, we're going to identify areas of need. Identify areas of need. IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, TAC, the Texas Administration Code, really between you and me, they don't care so much about the name of the disability. They care about the need. So write this down if you're taking notes. For every need, I must have a corresponding service. For every need, I must have a corresponding service. If I have a service, it's going to also be attached to a measurement of an IEP annual goal. So again, the goals could be academic areas. The only academic goals we're probably gonna have would be math, language, arts, and reading. You might have science and social studies if they're in a self-contained class. You might have functional goals, language goals, music therapy goals, occupational therapy goals, uh, communication, socialization, emotional, any, anything that happens at school. If your child has uh, struggles with eating, you might do a dysphagia evaluation. They might have feeding therapy goals. They might have goals to keep their clothes on. They might have goals to put their clothes on. They might have goals for ambulating, vision, um, and if they have a different kind of literacy, literacy or different kind of language. All of those would be annual goals. And what is an annual goal? It's from the first day of that meeting to a year later. So if today was the first day of our meeting, no kidding, April 1st, then those IEP goals would go to March 31st, 2025. It's an annual IEP year, okay? So that's how we write an annual goals. We identify the need, the annual goal is going to hold many components, but mainly it's gonna hold the baseline. What are we gonna do and where do we think he's gonna end up? And two things under the annual goal that need to be there, method of evaluation, and it's three words called weekly data collection, method of evaluation. And number two, the implementer, who is the person legally on the hook for delivering the goal, working on the goal, and also for taking data on the goal. We're gonna take data on the goal to see if we use making expected success, okay? Next one is pillar number three on the next slide. Needed accommodations, needed accommodations. Um, so we'll go back to, um, do you wanna just ask me the question about the goals? This is why I shouldn't look at the chat. Yeah. Well, there's a couple questions in queue, but the specific one that addresses the goals is when creating the annual goals, does the need have to be identified in the testing process or can the need be agreed upon in the IEP meeting? That's what's, it's identified in the meeting, right? So there might be an identified need that wasn't in the testing. I have had, we have kiddos that test beautifully. And as all of you guys know, at the university, we have kids that test beautifully. But when you really look at the rubber meets the road, what's happening day in, what's happening in the classroom, right? Because while I love standardized testing, it's just that, right? Sometimes kids crush standardized testing. Why? Because they're alone. They can concentrate with an adult. But what happens day in and day out in the classroom? What happens at home? You could get um, in-home parent training. You could get um, parent training. So any of the identified need, what does a pediatrician say? Um, you know, what happens when the student gets upset that may not sit inside of the, uh, the FIE? So the FIE is a major component, but it's not the sole component. So that's, it's really important that everybody puts all of their input in so we have the correct present levels. But we definitely have to identify the need in the present level. Good question. Okay, one more question. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Something tied to this with the goals and everything. But what if the school wants to exit a student, um, for example, from dyslexia, but they're not really hitting those, or they're not they're not showing that they're ready yet. For example, a student that has scores of twenty percent and forty percent, they're not hitting that mastery level. Um, how do we address that in, with goals and exiting? And yeah, so I'm allergic to exiting. Um, so I, I've been vaccinated for that. I don't find, um, in 28 years of doing this, I can, I think in the last decade, and I know that for sure, I've only had one child ever need to leave special ed to go to a 504. One, one. 
So I would love to tell you that the need evaporates. We certainly can move from dyslexia intervention to maintenance, um, but I think that we don't test well. I think that often we use words that are really sexy like dyslexia, right? And then we test for dyslexia. Well, you miss the other nine. There's nine SLDs, nine dyslexia, basic reading, reading fluency, reading comprehension, written expression, math computation, math calculation, oral expression, and listening comprehension. That's nine. So dyslexia is just dyslexia. I have never, say with me, never had a student that was just dyslexic. Never, never. They have their first cousin, ADHD, and then they have their other cousins that show up in a reading or another SLD. And so what happens is when well-meaning parents go in and say, I want him tested for reading or dyslexia, because his brother has it, da, 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 the school tests for dyslexia. And then you limited the scope of identification, which then limits the scope of an intervention. So I'm always saying, okay, so Stephanie, you want to exit him? I'm on board with the exit. But you get out the same way you got in. And we're going to do those eight areas of testing to see if currently he no longer has any. I hope he does. I would love to be wrong about this. But I don't find that that occurs very often in, in my experience of doing 500 IEPs a year. Okay. How might we uh, make sure? How might we prepare ourselves for um, a meeting in that we don't want the child exited? <laughs> the question was, how do we see to it the child is not exited? How would we prepare ourselves to approach that during the meeting? Sure, so, um, so let me, um, and so this would be part of the present level. So when I, and I train people, we have a two day training that would be great for all of you. We have a mastermind training, which is amazing. It goes more in depth, but I'll give you this. So when it, whenever I come to the table, I'm bringing data too. Love Stephanie, love Natalie, love Michelle. I, but their, their data is limited too. So I'm always going to have my parent do two things. I want a three-minute cold read, a three-minute cold read. I think reading is the most unidentified need that there is. I think that's the reason USA Today is written at a seventh grade level. I think that's the reason that 88% of people in prison can't read, but that's a, a training for another day. So I'm going to have, I, I'm advocating for Michelle. I'm going to say, I need your son to give me a three minute cold read. What does that mean? Michelle is going to reach out to, um, you know, Red Elementary School and say, hey, what is the reading level my student's on? The independent, not instructional. What's this independent reading level? So she'll either pull readers, she'll grab them off the internet. And I want you to take your little phone and record him reading. That's all I need you to do. I can know what's going on watching a kid read for three minutes. I think what's important to know from parents is that when they tell you your child's reading level, they read for 60 seconds. I don't know too many of us that go to work or school and have to read for 60 seconds. And so in that reading, I wanna know several things. What are his WCPMs? What are his words correct per minute? What was his independent reading level? How many, how was his accuracy? Meaning how many times did he self-correct? How many times did he skip a word? How many times did he switch a word? How many times like Karen, did he just make something up? A lot of times kids are using their other skills and it looks like they're reading, even if it's out loud, it's, it's um, delightful, it's engaging and none of, none of that was on the paper, none of it, right? And so I want that three minute cold read. Um, I was just with a client today and she called me and her daughter's going into seventh grade. She reads 55 words correct per minute. That is atrocious. So if you look up 90 years of oral reading fluency by Hans Brook and Tinsdale, which is the national standards on air.ed.gov, it will tell you the standards for oral reading fluency. And just really quickly, first graders, first graders read 59 words correct per minute. Fifth graders read 138 words correct per minute. Well, what's the big deal, Karen? Her comprehension's fine. Well, the reason that you read, need to read more in junior high is because I've doubled the volume that you have to read to finish the academic test. And so people usually read and talk at the same rate, the same prosody, the same cadence. And we know from reading Rockets 1999 that fluency pretty much is the only bridge to comprehension when you get there. So I'm going to show up with those three minute cold reads and I'm not gonna have one, I'm gonna have four. And you know, you know what? They're usually pretty much alike. And I will say things like, I have her reading on my phone. Would you like me to play the recording? That's what people say, say it with me. No. You know why? Because they know what her reading is, right? And then number two that I'm going to show up for when they're wanting to DNQ her or wanting to make some decision and pivot her inner 
interventions that I don't agree with. I want a three minute cold right. So I'm gonna have Michelle's son. He's seven. I'm gonna say, Michelle, what's your son's favorite thing right now? Oh, it's roadblocks. Great. Give him a piece of paper when he's happy. He's had a snack on the weekend and just say, Miss Karen wants you to write about roadblocks. And just have him write for three minutes and videotape it. And that's it. And then you scan that piece of paper. I learned so much. I can see how they're processing, how they're they're waiting, how they're thinking. They're looking to somebody to help them, right? And I very rarely have I found those two pieces of content that I show up with data to be refuted at the IEP table. What happens usually is when you get writing from a teacher who loves kids, that's his seventh edit, right? Or when you get a reading level, maybe it was instructional, meaning when he was saying ladder, 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 it was really louder and she helped him. And these little pieces of information pivot. Kids do not catch up on their own. We don't close gaps. Our job is to make sure the gap doesn't get bigger. So I'm going to be very clear about my position before we stop a child's intervention. Again, it's not my, my experience. Of course, I could be wrong. Um, that children all of a sudden do not need special education and related services. So, so those two pieces are going to be paramount. If you get really in a pickle, you might um, need representation. And so certainly our, our team of uh, advocates that we've trained nationally represent families everywhere. But sometimes you're just a little bit in over your head. But if you have those pieces of data, that really drives outcomes. Okay. All right, so I'm going to switch back to pillar number three, and then we'll get to all of your questions for sure before before we deboard tonight. So pillar number three, needed accommodations. Um, most important word there is needed, right? So when I look at accommodation sheets, and you've got 75 accommodations, I'm going to take out my scissors and prune that. What is accommodation? It is a civil right. It is something that we've decided in the meeting. Without this accommodation, Billy is not make it going to make. He's not going to meet his IEP goal. It's not a. Uh, Mm, uh, he might need it just it's just in case there's no such thing as just in case for a civil right so go in there and make sure that he needs them and then make sure they're in the right columns does he need a word wall in pe Pro probably not, right and make sure when you look at accommodations sometimes your kid has been listed so many accommodations what we really need to convert those accommodations is into special education more accommodations do not change a child's outcome. So really look at them, talk through them. Why does he need extra time? Not a fan of extra time. Will never be a fan of extra time for a child with disability. Because if he needs extra time, that's going into another time, which goes into another time. Maybe he needs less of an educational product. Maybe we need to reduce the TEKS, the state standards, and to see if he gets the base of the content, right? But sometimes when you have so many accommodations, it's because this isn't excited about giving you special education and related services, okay? Number four, where to implement the student's program, LRE. So let me just say it really loud for the people in the back. LRE is not a place. It's not a place. It's never going to be a place. It's not a place. Least restrictive environment is um, a consideration. A consideration is not a place. The law says that we have a responsibility, an onus, and a duty to educate students with disabilities to the maximum extent possible with their non-disabled peers. That's it. That's all it says. It never even uses the word gen ed. So really well-meaning people who are in schools who are not really trained well by their school districts in special education, which is tragic, um, which was one of the reasons we're happy to do it, it never says anything about general ed. So when you're in a meeting and somebody said, oh, I just really want him to get back to LRE. LRE is a discussion, it's not a location. So it simply means in this content area, what do we believe, and an IEP is our best informed guess, right? What do we believe is the right setting for math? What do we believe is the right setting for science? What do we believe is the right setting for PE? And it's not your in or out, but we go over that and with supports and services and related services, supplementary aids to see what's appropriate. It's not good news. It's not bad news. You're not in trouble. Special ed's not a scarlet letter. It's not printed on, out on your transcript. That went away years ago. My, my son that was in special ed and resource graduated in 2013. And even then in Texas, it doesn't say special ed on your document. Please don't say to parents, <gasps> if you put him in this class, he won't go to a four-year college. But let's not do that. Let's, let's stop that. I know lots of people that didn't go to a four-year college and finish. I'm one of them who's doing phenomenal in life. 
Um, so if four-year college is for your kiddo, great. But let's not try to sway parents telling them, like, let's not suck any air in between our teeth at meetings. That should just be illegal. You should like, you know, have a spray bottle for people that do that. But we don't do that. But anyway, so we we want Michelle to make an informed decision. We don't want to try to sway her decision. That's called manipulation. That's called manipulation. We want to give Michelle the information and her and her family with the team can make an informed decision. It is not your child. It's not your child. So if it's not your child, let the parent, guardian, surrogate parent make an informed decision based on clean collaboration from the school district. Okay. Um, all right, next pillar number five. Um, the students required special education support time called the schedule of services page, the determination of services page, um, save our student page. Um, notice I use the word required, <laughs> required special education time. So used to, in the, in the olden days, we would put, you know, English, we would put all of their content area and we would put gen ed, special ed. So all that's required by law now is that the special ed minutes are listed there. So we've decided that Billy needs special ed support in English for 80 minutes a week. We've decided he needs 40 minutes a week in science. We've decided he needs co-teach in math. And we list those special education support times. What is the support there? It's to provide him SDI. What is SDI? Specially designed instruction. That's an instruction I'm going to give to the student with a disability above what the general ed teacher could do. So the word special education and specially designed instruction are the same thing. It's the secret sauce. It's what you know Dr. Rogers is gonna do for the student. It's going to help him make progress on his IEP goal and teach him strategies to self-manage his disability. It's very important on the schedule of services page that you identify who is that adult, who is that other adult in the room supporting my kiddo, okay? And so next um, next slide, partnering with the school district, district for an appropriate impl implementation of FAPE. Appropriate is that which is appropriate for your child's unique circumstances. We call them unique circumstances in the federal law, not disabilities. Um, and FAPE is a free appropriate public education, meaning there's no charge for your student to receive special education and related services at a public school. And then next, the next slide is it's going to be time to reassess your child. So by law, um, every three years is called a triennial. We are charged with looking at if the student needs to be reassessed in specific and or all areas. And so you might agree with the committee that we need to reassess in speech, we need, need to reassess in um, achievement, or we might agree as a committee to not do any new assessments. We agree as a committee, his his eligibilities are appropriate and just pull that current, or you might retest in all areas. You can retest your child annually if you believe there's a new need or your child's never been tested in that area. For all the school-based members that are listening, you cannot deny the parent reassessments or new assessments once they're already eligible in special education. It's illegal. You can certainly choose to tell the parent no for initial testing, wouldn't recommend that, but you could certainly choose that. You cannot legally deny the parent new testing if it's never been done or if it's time for new testing. So um, often when I am in a meeting, people are not happy I'm there. I don't know why. I'm one of my favorite people. Um, and I'll say, hey, Stephanie, we would like, um, we are so glad that he's in school in Indiana. We would like for William to also have a music therapy evaluation. Why? Which is always a lovely response, right? Um, to see if that will help him with his special education. So when you're asking for testing, you have to know that that costs money. Special ed testing, it costs money. So you have to be prepared for what I call the pushback, right? And so you are not in, under interrogation. You haven't been arrested. Stephanie, tell me every reason that you want him to have music therapy. So there's your answer. We, well, I'm not a music therapist. However, I'm certain when you complete your evaluation, we'll have information to talk about and make a decision. Right. So related services and special education are for children that have disabilities. And because I'm not that professional, I don't know all those answers to your questions. But I do believe that it might be special education or this related service that would help him make gains on his IEP. That's simply all that you need to know. If you continue to have pushback about testing, I would simply say, listen, Michelle, it seems like you're not wanting to grant the testing. Should you choose to deny the parent special education testing, please provide that denial in a prior written notice. 
usually finishes that conversation and they say, that's not what I was saying. You can have the testing. Super, right? I don't want to get in a, a battle over testing. So um, usually when you ask for a prior written notice, when you disagree, um, that usually stops the disagreement. Not always, but almost always. Okay, and then the next slide, um, which is my mission statement. When we get it right for the child, we get it right for everybody. And it's true. If we get it right for the child, we got it right for everybody. Um, and so you can find us on any platform, special education boss. Um, next, please let us know how we can serve you. You know, there's nothing that excites us more than training people. And they say, hey, I was in my meeting today in Michigan. And I said what you said, and they did it. And, and you know, we, we don't need any credit. We just need kids to win, right? That's what we want. It's we want kids to win. And we want this IEP process to be as smooth and, and successful for kiddos, parents, and all the adults involved. Um, if you need anything, you can email us at admin at Special Education Academy. And because you've been in this webinar or you're viewing it, we'll certainly provide you a code for two weeks free to Special Education Academy, or we're trained weekly on the federal code, um, the application of the law in the spirit of the law. The next slide has all of the places you can hunt us down and all the places on the interweb um, and all of those things. We train, um, I do professional development for school districts, um, for um, associations, I speak nationally, and we train teachers, we train everybody that sits at the IEP table because when we get it right for the child, we get it right for everybody. So um, thanks you guys for attending, but this is my favorite part. We're gonna open it up for questions so we can get everything answered for you guys. I'm gonna jump in really quick and just say <clears throat> that this, um, this presentation is being recorded and it was also sent to us prior if you registered. So you do have access to this, even though you can't click on those resources right here, you can access that presentation that was in your email and then we'll also send the link again. Um, but one question that I did receive um, above was of course, many thanks to Karen for her wonderful resources here, but do you have like a checklist or anything um, that, or checklist or any kind of template or something that could help parents best prepare for IEP meetings prior to going into it? I mean, I think this is going to be a good checklist for you, right? These five pillars are paramount that we get them right. It's paramount that we stop and discuss them till we're completely all in agreement on these five areas. Um, we have a two-day training that is um, very long. Um, it's two days live or two days on demand, um, which really is for anybody that sits at the IEP table. And then we have a mastermind. We have digital products that you can buy um, or invest in that are um, have more specificity on our channel. Um, but I think that the reason this is one of my favorite presentations is these five areas, we have to have a deep conversation with at the meeting. Thank you. And then we had one question earlier on. Um, when it comes to assessment and child find, if we find very, very young students, like, for example, a very a three-year-old nonverbal with emotional outbursts, outbursts and physical aggression, what might testing look like for these very, very young individuals through child find? Yeah, so the testing is the same. So we're required to test children to see if they're in need of special education between the ages of three and 22. While the instruments are different, we have the ability to test those children in all of those areas that we talked about before. It's really important. We talk about this really kind of deep dive into eligibility and testing on the two-day training. Um, you know, if a child is nonverbal, we certainly want him to be tested cognitively with a normed and standardized instrument that's for children that are nonverbal. So there is the Tony, there is the unit, there is a lighter three. And we don't want you to give the three-year-old who's nonverbal WJ4. So um, it's important for all of us to be as informed as possible. Um, I had a, a student one time that was had Down syndrome and had a severe speech impairment, almost nonverbal. And she was five and somebody gave her the WJ4, which is the Woodcock Johnson 4, which is an amazing instrument for those of us that talk a lot. Um, but it couldn't have been more inappropriate. But if you didn't know that, um, her numbers came out really tragically low. And I gently, because I'm gentle, requested that the school district do it different with a different evaluator with a more appropriate instrument. And her numbers came way up. So we need the right testing and know the outcomes to do the right intervention. Okay, and so on the flip side of the coin, when you have um, students transitioning to adult programs, what might that look like for, um, 
any resources for young adults moving into the real world with disabilities or transitioning? Sure. So we have an amazing resource here in Texas called the Texas Workforce Solution. So I had uh, for several, a couple of terms, I served at um, the Texas A&M Center for Disabilities and Development and um, College Station. They have amazing programs there. Uh, but you want to get your child in Texas connected to Texas Workforce Solutions. Um, they are eligible. So under IDEA, and we're required by 16 to write a student a transition supplement. What does that mean? That I'm going to write a set of coordinated activities for him to be post-secondary successful, gainful employment, independent living, and further education. Whereas before 2004, we just graduated students with disabilities and said, bye. So one of those things that I have my parents do is I have their student do a full vocational intake by the when they're 14. And that means literally you just show up. Um, I'm all about just showing up in person and saying, hey, Stephanie, this is my son, Billy. He's 14. He has a disability at XYZ Independent School District. Here's his FIE and IP. I would like him tested for a full vocational intake. Um, that opens the door for services through Texas Workforce Solution. I love public schools, but there's a little gap between school and college or school and trade school or, or school in the real world. Um, then they can set you up with the ARC of Texas. They can set you up with DARS. It can set you up with your child needs a vocational coach for adulthood, um, whatever level support, a supported vocation, voluntary vocation. Um, but that really is going to be a great resource as it relates to post-secondary. Um, if you're looking for a resource inside of the school, uh, there's not a better handbook than the Oregon Resource Handbook. The Oregon, I'm sorry, the Oregon Transition Resource Handbook. The Oregon Transition Resource Handbook is gold. Um, they have trainings on there about uh, preparing kiddos for post-secondary success, how to build and write vocational goals inside of um, the IEP, um, because we have to start getting them post-secondary ready. And so you want to make sure that you start that at 14. I think what is the saying that the days are long and the years are quick before you have know it, you'll have a child that's getting into adulthood. Additionally, if you have a child that you believe that might be in need of guardianship, please have that sober conversation. Um, if a child is not cognitively able to take care of themselves, physically able to take care of themselves, emotionally able to take care of themselves, I would meet with a probate attorney and see if that was right for my family. Um, so guardianship comes in one of three ways. It's guardianship of your person, uh, guardianship of your estate, and then guardianship of both. I think sometimes parents don't realize that, let's say that you have a child that was in special education, greatly impacted by their disability and they're 19 and, you know, Aunt Myrtle leaves you $100,000 and he goes to his job and somebody says they're having a hard time paying their bills and he goes to the bank and gives them out, you know, takes out $10,000. That's gone, right? And I know a lot of us don't want to think about the acuity of our child's disability, but as an advocate, I get too many calls from children that are adult age and have been in situations they weren't ready to um, address, deal with, or overcome. And um, whether it's executive functioning or understanding, um, because they don't look like children with disabilities and they get into a number of situations. So um, as a mediator for the family courts myself, I certainly am a huge proponent for guardianship. Um, there also is supported decision-making. I'm not a fan of that. I'm just here to tell you the truth in case I'm never invited back. Um, supported decision-making is really good until your child tears up the paper. <laughs> so um, I, I think that's a, a low level of conversation. Uh, but for most of the kiddos that we serve that are going to be in the 18 to 21 program, I definitely want you to connect with a probate attorney. Of course, that's going to be an investment to see if um, he, need, he or she needs guardianship. Guardianship is only for 16 months. Um, and then you have to reapply every 16 months but it's to protect the child. It's not about the adult's feelings or what they think can happen, um, but it's to protect uh, your child. Thank you. And I just wanted to circle back to one, um, one thing you said about, <clears throat> you, you touched on the, I guess the, the emotion, the counseling assessment or, yeah. and you said it was, woefully underused or underdeveloped basically yeah we um, just like if they go to the office then you don't need a psychological evaluation i'm like what right so how might 
um, because I'm coming from a school counselor background who is, you know, supportive of all of these areas, but how might the general education school counselor help address um, that assessment and and work with the families with that during that IEP? Yeah, so- And and the- Yeah, so two parts, right? So when the FIE, we're a multidisciplinary team, I want that general ed counselor so much happens at the school that we don't really know about, right? I've had kiddos that go to the nurse 89 times in one year. Nobody mentioned that. Nobody calls home. You know why she went to the nurse? He was reading. She can't read. And nurses are so nice. Well, that doesn't usually just show up in the FIE. Or we go to Miss Rogers, the counselor, who's like the biggest champion of children. So the child's telling us they have needs. But we are so set up to go, can they write? Can they read? I have kids that are going to be the valedictorian that could need an IEP. I have kids that have all Fs that do not need an IEP. We are humans. Humans have needs. It's not solely in academics. Nobody's asked me this week the square root of pi. Not one person. Or about a parallelogram. Not that I know that, right? We get so focused on academics and state testing. Everybody on the planet has emotional needs. And everybody has strengths in their emotions and areas of need. And to not address that is just, it's tragic for kids because they're not, I can access some more history. I can access some more reading. I can learn some more science when I'm an adult. So probably, I'm probably going to struggle to access um, normed emotionality and how to access my world socially and emotionally. So when we look at a um a formal assessment like that, I guess, can you talk about counseling as a related service or about any of the related services that, that may, that may need out, but what is the warranting for outside services if no one's specialized enough to handle that, that kind of thing? Yeah. So counseling as related services is one of my favorite services. Yeah. They are so happy when I asked for that because it's free to this. No, it's not free to the school district. So, I mean, you have to remember as parents, when you're in a meeting, Here's what, you know, I tell parents. So I'm going into a meeting with Liz um, and we wonder sometimes what the pushback is. You have to realize that when I go into Elm Elementary School tomorrow and I have five IEP meetings, they already spent all the money at Elm Elementary School July 1st, 2023. And then I'm showing up and asking them to spend money on Billy and then asking him to give money, uh, related services. And so I, I get it, but it doesn't change my position. It just does not change my position, right? And so only people that can stick the landing in a respectful, clear, concise way are probably going to be able to access the services and support your student needs. So I ask for all the related service evaluations that would be appropriate for that child. I don't ask for O&M if your child doesn't have a vision impairment. I'm not asking for a Braille assessment if your child can is not visually impaired. I'm not asking for things that wouldn't be appropriate. Right. Um, but I'm going to ask for a functional behavioral assessment to see if there is an area of need. Do I need a behavior intervention plan? Do I need a counseling as a related service evaluation? Again, if you don't do the evaluation, you're not going to get the service. They're not going to just go, just kidding, you can have it. Right. If you don't ask for occupant, I cannot tell you how many times I said it with a kiddo who's newly identified with autism and a speech impairment. Probably the most common combination of disabilities that we see currently in 2024. I'm like, so he has a behavior intervention plan? Mm hmm. Have you done OT and sensory? No. But he doesn't write? No. Did you do OT and fine motor? And I'm just telling you, I don't find without somebody asking for it or encouraging it that it shows up in an evaluation, right? Because it just doesn't. The because doesn't really matter. When I train people, the why doesn't matter. What matters is what's next. If he needs counseling related service, he needs it, right? Um, but I'm not going to be swayed by people that tell me he doesn't need it uh, because he'll just, I had somebody tell me one time, well, he'll mature over the summer. I said, I have no idea what you, that means. I haven't matured over any summers yet. So I'm not really sure what that means. If he needs the service to benefit from his educational program, we provide it. And so, um, but if you don't ask for it, he won't get it. So what is counseling or related service at school? It's a service that helps a kiddo address the emotionality or those uh, pieces that impact him at school, right? I can't run out to the minivan and go, mommy, mommy, 
you know, Miss Williams was mean to me today and Bob didn't let me play back. There are things that happen at school. They're, they're a little higher than that. The kiddos just don't know how to address and navigate and negotiate successful. And they, they withdraw or they make bad choices. Well, just like somebody taught me algebra, somebody could teach me how to interact with my peers and adults more successfully. Um, but it is um, a very, probably a higher cost to the district. Um, but when a child benefits from counseling as a related service, it's gold. It's gold. Thank you. I did also want to add for everyone that counseling is related, related service still also needs to be tied to goals <laughs> in every area. So don't forget that piece as well. Um, I did. Dr. Rogers, I had counseling as related service. She's like, I'm tied to the math goal. I said, you're not. What? <laughs> it's like, no, right. you have your own goal. <laughs> I'll just attach to that. I'm like, I need counseling when I do math, but he doesn't. I don't. Right. <laughs> Um, I, one last question. Um, do you provide any trainings for public school staff? Would that be something that um, they can reset, reach out to your website? Yeah, absolutely. Your... I do professional development all the time. I'm doing a professional development this um, this Saturday in El Paso uh, for um, for I think, Children's Disability Coalition. I do professional development all the time. I love it. I love schools because I just tell them the truth. Um, and, and they need to ask me questions, you know, how, there's a, a PD that I do for school districts that actually an executive director wrote the title for me and it's called, Oh No, Karen's Coming, which I love it, right? And and it's not, Oh No, that Karen's Coming, but I'm going to ask you for that four letter word we get in a meeting, data. I'm not going to ask you about your feelings. I'm going to ask you about data because we can only make informed decisions with something I can graph, right? I love you know, Tristan's feelings about something and Kara's feelings about something, but I can't graph that. I need to graph where he is emotionally, physically, cognitively, academically, so that I can write an IEP goal, hopefully mitigate his uh, acuity of his disability based on rate of progress and expectation. And so um, I'm going to ask you to show me the data. So, um, but I love kids. I love everybody that works at schools. God bless teachers. I know they do it for the money and the fame. Um, they are changing kiddos' lives. And we must have training for school district personnel. We just don't. That's not a me issue. That's a school district issue. And so hopefully that will turn around one day because teachers are excited to have training and being equipped to serve kids. And everyone's very eager for it. Thank you. Um, I didn't see any other questions in the chat. And I did want to honor all of our time. So if everyone would also look at... Um, uh, Dr. Shin added the area to be able to get the CE certificate and the survey. And also this video has been recorded and will be posted on our website. Um, is there any final comments from Dr. Simmons or Dr. Shin or anyone else? I'll go ahead and post uh, that out. I, I just wanted so, to ask, thank you so much. This has been phenomenal. And again, want to encourage participants and those that might be watching this as a recording in the future to use your resource page as a place of future reference and as a resource I know that you have a whole lot of opportunities for parental support and similarly we will do the same through the Center for Learning Disabilities you know as we have parent requests for consultations and uh, we often get requests for needing advocacy support and I know that you are a phenomenal resource for that and the only other piece that we didn't list in the um, comments, but I am eager to go ahead and share with attendees. We have a set a date and guest lecture for our 12th annual Helen Pill Distinguished Lecture Series. And that is going to be in the fall, October 10th. That's a Thursday. Um, and our guest lecture is going to be Dr. Thomas Brown, Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience of the Brown Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders um, and also works with the University of California. I'm sure it is a name that is very familiar to many of you and we are quite excited that he has agreed to um, be a part of our lecture series. It will be both face-to-face -face here at West Texas A&M University as well as webinar format. So anyone could join from any location uh, statewide or nationally, and we have the information up on our website, but registration will be open within the next couple of weeks so that you could go ahead and start signing up for that.
Well, thank you so much for your time this evening. It has been uh, highly valuable. Just to, obviously, we could have sat here for an entire day with you. <laughs> Yeah, I love training and we would love to see you guys on any of our platforms. Everything that we teach goes up on all of our platforms. We go live every Tuesday night for an hour on TikTok live. We have about 7,000 people log on and we just, I have about five moderators and we just ask question after question. And then we cut those questions up and put it back up. It's really, it's about equipping people. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks you guys.